friends, and welcome to All By My Shelf. I'm Miss Rachel, and it's so nice to see you. Today's panel is Queer Across the Ages. Five incredible authors are talking with CC from Pops and Book Nerd, telling you all about what it takes to write queer books for different age groups. Those authors are Kyle Lukoff, Wendy Hurd, Mark Oshiro, Jason Callender, and Robin Stevenson. If you're a Glenside patron, make sure you click the link in the description like Lindsay. That will bring you to a page telling you all of the books you can currently check out from this panel. Or if you prefer hard copies, you can fill out the form and let me know which of those to put on hold for you once the library is able to reopen. I hope you enjoy. YouTube channel Problems of a Book Nerd, where I talk about queer books. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and you can find me over at Problems of a Book Nerd. I'm making videos all the time. Uh, and today I am joined by an absolutely incredible panel of authors here. We are talking about queer across the ages, so all of these lovely folks have written for uh, multiple age groups. They've written queer books for multiple age groups. So we are joined by Case and Calendar, Marco Shiro, Wendy Hurd, Kaya Lukoff, Robin Stevenson, and I'm actually going to turn it over to them to introduce themselves. So I thought we would do alphabetical, and uh, Kaysen, do you want to start? Sure. Um, so I'm Kaysen Calendar. I use they, them, or he, him pronouns, and I'm the author of uh, Hurricane Child, King and the Dragonflies. Those are two middle grades. My YA books, this is kind of an epic love story, and Felix Ever After, which is coming on, on coming out on May 5th, and Queen of the Conquered, and King, of the Ri King and the Rising. No, King of the Rising. That's why you shouldn't have two books. <laughs> it starts with King. <laughs> um, but King of the Rising is coming out later this year. Great. Very cool. Uh, Wendy? Hey, I'm Wendy Hurd. I am she, her pronouns. And I have my most recent adult book that just came out is The Kill Club. And upcoming, I have a YA, She's Too Pretty to Burn. I write thrillers. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Um, Kyle, you want to go ahead? Hi, um, my pronouns are he, him. I write picture books, early readers, and middle grade. Um, my picture books right now are When Aiden Became a Brother, which just won the Stonewall. Yeah, I don't get to accept it in person, but that's okay. Um, and then two nerdy ones about language, Explosion at the Foam Factory, and A Storytelling of Ravens. I have an early reader series called Max and Friends, which is about a little trans boy and his gay little friends and their adventures. I have a middle grade novel coming out next year called Too Bright to See. And then I have another picture book that I that has not been announced yet, but it is a nonfiction uh, biography that I'm working on with someone that I feel very strongly about. Um, so that's exciting. Ooh, very exciting. <laughs> uh, Mark, you want to go ahead? Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Mark Oshiro. I am the author of Anger is a Gift, which is a young adult novel, um, which is, <laughs> I, I like to use the pitch for, that Nick Stone does, which is, what if the hate you give was immensely gay? Um, I just love it. It's just a great, succinct summary. Um, I have my next YA book out in like four four months or so. It's called Each of Us a Desert. It's a fantasy. And then my middle grade debut, uh, The Insiders, is out next fall. So fall of 2021. Awesome. Very, very cool. All right, Robin, you want to finish this off? Sure. Hi. Yeah, Robin Stevenson. My pronouns are she, her. 
Uh, I live out on the west coast of Canada and I write books for all ages. So um, my books, I've got a board book called Pride Colors for babies and toddlers. It's currently a finalist for the Lambdas, which again, I don't get to go to in person, but still very cool. Um, a picture book called Ghost's Journey, which is a, a story of two gay refugees from Indonesia. And um, oh, hey, thank you, Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> and it's uh, illustrated with um, art based on the photos that they took. It's about their cat and th their journey to Canada. Um, I have a middle grade uh, nonfiction book that um, it's called Pride, the Celebration and the Struggle. Um, and I also write YA. Um, I have several teen novels um, and I have one that was supposed to be coming out this May, but it's been postponed until May 2021. So because of the pandemic. So yep. yeah. <laughs> I know I know a bunch of release dates have been pushed. Yeah. Um, so I thought we'd start right out and I wanted to ask a question of anyone. Anyone can jump in whenever you'd like to, but I was curious, when you start the process, do you already know what age group you're going to be writing for, or is that something, a decision that comes along later in the process? I guess I could start. Um, for my middle grade, I definitely know when it's going to be a middle grade when I start out. Um, I feel like the voice just from the get-go is so different from YA and adult that it has to be very clearly middle grade. Besides content, I feel like the voice is what really makes it um, different for me. I think that there is, for me personally, a bit of a more difficult blurry line between the um, adult and YA. And Wendy, you can talk about this also. I'm curious to see if it's difficult for you too. But um, because the voice can be so similar for me, it's difficult to figure out whether it's going to be an, a YA or an adult. And even for Queen of the Conquered, um, when that went out with my agent, it first was actually submitted to both uh, editors who did YA and adult just to see where it would land. So it could have been a YA also. Hmm. I get a lot of like people saying that my adult books read YA, even when they're way older than YA and they have like very adult issues in them. Something about the voice, I guess, is just the writing style. I'm not quite sure. But yeah, I get I get accused of that a little bit. Well, it's not a bad thing, but <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, like you, I, I, I also, it's, it just feels obvious to me once I get down to the story, especially with the voice. And I think like when you're, when I'm actually writing the manuscript is when I feel even more certain. Um, I haven't ventured into the adult space, so I haven't had, you know, I, I wrote technically my first adult story last week, but I don't <laughs> know that it feels that different to me yet. So, um, but yeah, it's, it's always felt very obvious what age group I'm writing for from the beginning. Yeah, I usually usually know what age group I'm writing for when I begin. But having said that, I have two YA novels which began as short stories that I thought were for adults mm -hmm. and kind of mm -hmm. got too long to be short stories. And I thought perhaps they could work as, as teen novels. Um, and I've got a book that I'm working on right now that I'm just sort of at the idea stage. And I'm not actually sure if it should be middle grade or YA. So I'm still trying to make a decision about that but uh, i will decide that before i actually start writing yeah for me all of my ideas hit at the same time so like for my debut middle grade i thought to myself i want to write a middle grade novel and also i want to write a ghost story and also i want to write a story about a trans boy and i was like those three ideas could just go together and that could be the book that i write um you know when i started to work on aiden i thought i want to write a picture book about a trans boy it wasn't this idea about a kid who becomes a big brother that just fit picture book format. I was intentional about the audience. Um, someday I want to write for grownups again, and I have a couple ideas like down the pike. And I thought to myself, I want to write a novel for adults about this like larger idea. Um, and there's no worry that I have of that like accidentally slipping into another age group. Um, it might happen someday though. I might have to mess with something to make it work. Very cool. Well, um, kind of still jumping off of different age groups, I'm curious what you see as sort of your responsibility when writing queer stories for different ages. Like, does, does your intent change when you're writing queer middle grade, uh, queer early readers, queer adult? How does it shift between those different age groups? 
I don't want to start every time, y'all. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll go. I'll go first. Um, I think, I think, I, I, one of the great things about middle grade is that I think there's this mistaken idea that there's certain things you can't write about or certain stories you can't tell middle grade. And I think this boom we're having in middle grade is showing that that's not true. I definitely think though that the content that I'm writing, like what I'm writing in my middle grade, I tend to have stories and characters that deal far more heavily in hope than I do. I feel like in young adult is where now I can start to twist and talk about things that have a little bit more complication, like what it feels like to not be sure of your identity. Whereas like with my middle grade, you know, with the insiders, there's never any question this kid knows he's gay. One of the other kids knows they're not, there's no question about what they are. Instead, it's more about what are the journeys that they go on? How does their identity form that? Whereas in my young adults was where I feel like I can play a little bit more. There can be more confusion and layers of meaning to things. Um, and certainly a little bit, I can go further down the darker path than I can, than, or not that I can, but that I feel comfortable going in middle grade, which is not to say that middle grade shouldn't have darkness. I def there's definitely some in the insiders, but I feel like I can go further down that tunnel in young adult than I, than I do with middle grade. Yeah, I agree with my middle grade. Um, my I always want to make sure that it's more hopeful than the YA would ever be in the adult for sure, because when I was that age range, um, or when I was that age, I had such a hopelessness that I feel like every single time I write for that age, it's kind of like a responsibility to make sure that the stories always have a hopeful ending or meaning, because I think of myself as that age reading that book, and then if it had a hopeless ending, I don't think things wouldn't have ended very well for me. Yeah. Um, but so I, when I'm thinking about the YA, on the other hand, there, it's still a lot more um, hopeful than the adult. Uh, and then the adult books, um, it's interesting because I actually made the choice to not make Sigourney um, uh, specifically queer in the text. Like I decided because it's so dark and because she is such a complicated, ruthless, evil character that I did not want the first like black queer woman I wrote to be this tyrant. So, you know, in my head, I was like, she's probably queer, but I'm not going to put it on the page. But um, uh, the other character of King of the Rising, Lauren, um, is asexual. And I felt like it was a little, I felt more freedom to be able to write about um, his character because he's not such a horrible person, <laughs> you know? So I agree with a lot of what, oh, were you done, Kaysen? I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. I saw the little green light blink off and I assumed that meant you so. Okay. Um, I agree with a lot of what Mark and Kaysen were saying about hope and darkness and where that plays into the different ages. And then also, so I, in addition to being a writer, I'm also an elementary school librarian. So I tend to think also a lot about not just the child audience, but who are the gatekeepers to getting mm. to that children's audience. Mm. So there are things that I might want to say directly to children that I know might not make it past their adult, their caregivers, their parents, their teachers, the reviewers, the librarians, such as myself. Like, so when you're writing for adults, there aren't quite as many gatekeepers as there are for kids. So you have to please all of these different audiences at the same time, just to get it into the hands of a kid. Um, and then also I think about the social responsibility when working with children, whether it's through books or as an educator, and how, you know, you can hurt adults with books or media or harmful narratives as well. But it's different when, you, let's say you read something at 35 that hurts your feelings for the next five years. That's different than when a kid, a, a kid encounters something at eight and that hurts them and it influences the way they see themselves all the way through their adolescence. Mm -hmm. And I think that we need to be more conscious of children's emotional and psychological well-being because they're still very much forming like who they are and how they see themselves and how they see the world around them. I just want to jump in and say that that was perfectly said though. That was, I've never, yeah. yeah. It was. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Well, I mean, I agree with what everybody else has said, absolutely. Um, I would add, when I'm writing for really young kids, um, I'm very much thinking about the parent who would be reading the book to the child as the audience. Um, so with Pride Colors, because it's a board book, I mean, babies hopefully are gonna like that it has bright colors and it has photos of babies and they're gonna like that their parent or caregiver is saying, I love you a lot, but they're not necessarily looking for a whole lot more than that if they're, if they're um, that age. So I was really thinking about when my 
own kid was that age and the books that I would read to him and how much it's about that um, relationship between the parent and child and the words that the, the parent is saying to the child. Um, so I was writing messages that I wanted parents to read to their children. Um, mm -hmm. And so really thinking about, um, yeah, how, how, you know, if, if a parent is saying to their child, you know, I'll always love you, I'll love whoever you grow up to be, you can be who you are, you can love who you choose, that, that if hopefully if they're saying those words and thinking about those things, it's, it's to me almost like maybe on some level they're, they're making that commitment to that baby, that, that they can, that they will always be there for them. So I was really thinking about the parent as audience and what the impact of reading it would be on parent as much as, as on the baby, if that makes sense. Um, that was beautifully said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I felt um, I were I write in crime fiction for adults, and I definitely felt a lot of like nervousness about being gay and queer in that space um, because it's not really a space that has a lot of queer mainstream fiction like young adult does. You know, where it's like a thriller, but it just happens to also have gay characters. So in some ways, I felt a lot more free writing in young adult because I felt like people aren't gonna be mad that this is gay. It's, it's okay that this is gay. They'll even like put it on the cover copy, you know? Whereas like in, a, in adult crime fiction, it was very like, my friend and I were joking about like, it has to have like just the right amount of gay, like not too much, <laughs> not too little, like just the right amount. And we kept joking like as we sent manuscripts back and forth, like, does it have the right amount of gay or is it just too much? Tone it down, the volume down, you know? So well, I don't know about you all. I just, I felt a little bit more nervous in that space, I think. Yeah. Well, in that vein, do you think any of you have seen like a significant shift in the type of queer stories that are being published now versus a few years ago? Yeah. Yes. I mean, we're all like kind of like, yeah, shaking. I mean, <laughs> it's so interesting to talk about too, because I think of like what, you know, in the young adults, like in Kidlet in general, what things were allowed to be published. Um, and you see this with other marginaliz marginalizations and the combination of them is that most of us had to write about the struggle. That was the only way we could get anything published. Um, and I say that having written a book about the struggle, like that was the, I had other stories that never got any interest from editors or agents that were fantasy or portal fantasy or like fluffy contemporary. And it took the book writing about racism uh, and police brutality, that, that's the thing that finally people are like, oh, this is a worthy story, you know, we'll pay attention to it. So, um, you know, I like to, you know, I'm gonna slightly embarrass Kaysen, but like, this is an epic love story. Like, I think one of the things that's so rad and important about that book is we, we really do just need more of us in rom-coms. We need more of us in books where, it's not that there's no conflict, but it's not like, end of the world, this is a after school special, you know, sort of like vibe that was for a long time, the only thing that publishing would allow us to, to write, if that makes sense. Yeah, and I think that, um, I feel like both stories will always be necessary. Like Mark, yours is, I know yours has changed people's lives also, so. Yeah. I don't know. Oh, thank you. <laughs> but I mean, I think there, there should be room for both and then everything in between. The problem is, is that you get the sense that there's only one narrative, you know, that there's only one sort of story that's allowed if that's, you know, or if that's the one story that publishing is allowed, then people start thinking like, oh, this is actually what life is. This is the only thing, you know, queer people can't be happy at the end. They're, they can't survive until the end. They can't, you know, all of these like really insidious narratives have crept into our public consciousness be, uh, in large part because of how the media reflects it back at us. mic drop there's nothing else to say yeah. after oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> no that was we're doing this like doing it digitally too because it's that thing where you're like wait i don't want to interrupt before another person because we're all like right. slightly off you know so i guess the only other thing i would add to that um yeah i thought that was perfectly sad the, the other thing i would add is that there has been so much um change and so much growth in the industry but there's still so much room for um more intersectional identities and you know even recently I think people were discussing how there's been such a exciting boom in trans masculine voices in YA especially but 
it, it's so um, disheartening to me to see that there hasn't been as many trans um, women's or trans that feminine voices. That was me. I, I tweeted Oh, that. did you say that, Kyle? <laughs> that was me. Kyle, take it from here. You're the... <laughs> <laughs> That's it, though. Like, well, it's, yeah. I mean, it's interesting. Like, early on, there's April Daniels, Meredith Russo, um, Lisa Bunker, who are, like, three trans women who originally got published in Kidlet. And now there's tons of my team, which is great, because, you know, team boys, I guess. Um, but now I don't know of, like, I'm unfamiliar with more trans women being published, and that sucks. Cause... Yeah, there's definitely so much more space for that. And also for trans women of color, they're, the trans women of color are still, like, one of the most, um, you know, attacked and, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? Um, not protected, unprotected groups in the country, and their stories need to, there just needs to be more stories out there. There's still room for growth. Robin, did I see you trying to jump in? Sorry, oh, I just wanted to make no, sure. I was, just, I was just thinking, yes, everything everybody has said, more books, more diversity, more representation, more types of books, more genres, all of that. Um, hopefully an adult as well. Wendy, I, I, that was interesting what you were saying, and I, I have half an adult thriller written that I've kind of been, you know, putting aside for other projects and going back to and have been thinking about that. Um, as well, but then that the way you put it in terms of the right amount of gay, like it, it feels different to me than writing a YA novel where I'm like, you know, the gayer the better and I'm not gonna, yeah, I, I, I yeah, it, it's, so that was interesting. And the other thing that I was just thought was interesting was um, a couple of comments about uh, not wanting to make a character who was a queer character be like not a likable character or not a, a not a sympathetic, character I can't remember exactly what the, the, the yeah original comment was but but thinking about that and how in some of my earlier middle grade novels um, I have a middle grade novel called the summer we saved the bees and originally um, the main character was going to have um, a queer family two moms but the mom was really a little bit uh, out there and I just thought you know what I don't, I don't want to make the, the queer parent like not really a great parent um, mm. so I ended up making, um, her, uh, in a relationship with a man and then added, um, another family that the family kind of encounters in the course of the book who were a lesbian couple who are like these like awesome parents. And I, you know, and it's just kind of funny cause I just felt like I couldn't make the, the, the slightly, uh, you know, loopy mom, the queer, the queer parent. Um, whereas I think now I would feel a little more freedom to, have the queer characters not all be like role model likable perfect people you know which I really sort of felt initially like um I don't know some some I would I would struggle with that every time like how am I representing this person and so I don't know so hopefully as there's just more and more there's less pressure on each individual one to somehow be um you know representative of anything other than themselves but, can I yeah. can I jump in on that for a second um I'm working on another middle grade right now that I'm very excited about where I, I probably can't say too much about it yet, but the one of the primary antagonists is an older trans man, not antagonist in that he's the enemy, but he is, you know, kind of what helps incite the conflict in the novel. And then one of the protagonists is a younger non-binary kid. And I'm looking more at like kind of generational divides and schisms within aligned like queer trans identities which is my favorite thing to write about i think part of why this is a thing that we all are very conscious of because i've been very conscious about who is what identity in the stories i'm constructing is that because they're so relatively to, or relative to you know cis straight stories there's so little of us that we are always worried that we're going to fall in to do these harmful tropes if we write certain things. Whereas I, f I feel as we get more stories, as more of us in our community get to tell our stories, I feel like there's more room for us to finally start getting a, the messy stuff. Like I think about like, one of my favorite books last year was Wilder Girls by Rory Power, which every sentence of that book exudes gay. Like it is one of the queerest books I've ever read. And they, there are terrible messy people in that book but because there's so many queer characters, the one 
that is terrible to other people doesn't feel representative of the entire community. Um, there's a book that comes out this fall called Beyond the Ruby Va Veil by Mara Fitzgerald, which has the most chaotic, evil murder lesbian I've ever read in my entire life. There is almost no redeeming factor except for how funny this character is. Like nothing about her, I'm like, I don't actually want to be friends with her because she would murder me. Like, this is terrible. But I love that we're like, we're at a point where we're in queer fiction, where especially in YA, where we are starting to actually get momentum and have enough that it is okay that we can now write villains. Like, and and it doesn't uphold like the same meaning and the same like negative tropes and associations that it used to. Yeah, thank you for saying that, Mark. That's exactly what I was gonna try to um, say because I think I was saying that earlier about with Sigourney Rose for Queen of the Conquered. I didn't really want to make her obviously um, queer on the page because she is like this horrible tyrant. And I feel like there has been so much growth in queer fiction in general for maybe like white characters where maybe that feels a little bit better. But personally, I haven't actually seen enough black queer women um, in any sort of media to the extent that we have of like white queer women mm -hmm. where I wouldn't feel as comfortable making her the tyrant just yet. And it's unfor it is unfortunate. I wish I did feel more comfortable because I know that she, I know that black queer women are human and not representative of only by Sigourney Rose. <laughs> I know that they contain multitudes and are not just Sigourney Rose, but I don't know. I just didn't want, I just didn't feel comfortable with the idea of someone picking up the book, not having had as much experience with black queer women as they should have and being like, oh yeah, this is how black queer women are, huh? Mm -hmm. They're horrible. They're not. <laughs> yeah. Well, in that vein, I know that we've been talking about books that we have loved recently, but I want to make sure that everyone gets a chance to talk about, like, if you would love to shout out a recent or soon to be published queer book that you have really loved, um, I'd, I'd love to just hear some some positivity about the the stuff that's being published right now. I have two. I can go, because I pulled one out from a stack next to me. So... I loved The Only Black Girls in Town um, by Brandy Colbert. It's not a, pri like the main character isn't queer, but her dads are gay. And just every, every book by this person is perfect in like a really low key way. And one of my favorite tiniest little moments is where the main character at one point says something like, oh, I've never something, she refers to a pregnant person, just like off the cuff, not pregnant woman, but pregnant person. It's just like this perfect, like little subtle signal that like, yeah, like there's lots of kinds of people in this world. And it's just, oh, I just, I love this book. It's so good. And then my friend Julian Jarbo just released uh, his book called Everyone on the Moon is Essential Personnel. And it's a book of wild short stories. Some of them are just like a couple pages and I'm about 30% of the way through. And I rarely recommend a book before I finish the whole thing. Cause what if, a story halfway through I don't like, but so far I love it. And it's just, it's, I mean, I want to say it's out of this world, but the title is about the moon and that feels like a cheap joke. It really is out of this world. Um, Darius the Great deserves better. Oh. Oh my God. Did you read it, Mark? Yeah, I, yeah. I, funny story, I read it, I was at a retreat with Adib Karam and read it while he was sitting next to me secretly. And he almost caught me once when I was like bawling because there's a <laughs> thing and you know the thing that happens and I just lost and I just started crying. And he was like, what are you, what are you reading? What's going on? I was like, oh, it's a really sad email. I was like, <laughs> it's this book. Um, it's incredible. It's, who? it's so good, Kason. It's so good. It's so good. I, my favorite book that I read last year, just incredible. Yeah. Darius the Great um, is not okay was one of my favorite books of like all time. So I was kind of, I'm always a little like sequel. Are you sure you want to touch with touch something that's already kind of perfect? Like you sure you want to do that? And he did it and he did yeah. that. It was, it was, it was a really great follow-up. I love it a lot. Um, my second would be, we are totally normal by Rahul Kanakia. I really love that book too. I thought it was like the perfect expression of, um, what it's like to actually question your identity on a, I feel like most times in my own writing, in, even in most books, I'm just kind of like, we just see the experiences and I questioned and then I figured it out. <laughs> and this really delves into like daily, like, I think I'm straight. No, I think I'm bi. No, I think I'm queer. I have no idea. And just changes like 
constantly and the stress that goes into that and then also just being okay with not really knowing just like chef's kiss perfect i love it I'm so excited to read the next Darius book. I loved the first one as well and was really, really excited to hear that there was going to be another book about Darius. So I'm really looking forward to that one. I haven't read it yet. Um, and Brandy Colbert as well as someone whose previous books I've loved and I'm so looking forward to reading her new one. Okay, funnily enough, the one I'm in the middle of reading right now is this one. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I loved Hurricane Child. I'm so enjoying oh, thank you. it. So, um, I'm only about a third of the way through, so don't tell me anything. But um, the writing is just so beautiful. And, um, you know, it just, uh, yeah, it makes me want to go to Louisiana. And it's just, yeah, just so beautiful. So thank you. Thank I'm really you. enjoying it. And um, the other one that I'm about to read, and again, not a recommendation, I guess, because I haven't read it yet, but I'm really excited about it, um, is Patrick Mess's Burn. Um, just because Patrick Ness is, is so original and creative and his books are all so different that you kind of have no idea what to expect from, from, from each one and also dragons. So I'm excited to, to read that as well. Yeah. Well, I just uh, read Caleb Rorig's uh, The Fell of Dark. Oh. Vampires, sexy vampires. So awesome, highly recommend. Very cool. What was it called? The Fell of Dark. The cover has these neon fangs, the like vampire fangs. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Really good. Yes. Um, I, I recommend it already. Uh, Beyond the Ruby Veil by Mara Fitzgerald. Evil, murder, chaos, lesbian is really all you need to know about this fantasy book. It's so good. Um, uh, I'm, I don't have like a final version, but I'm very excited because I, I just finished this, but it's uh, How It All Blew Up by Arvind Amati, uh, which is a uh, book that Arvind is, and a story Arvind's been working on for so long. And I've been talking to Arvind about the struggle to like truly, truly write like a super, super queer book. And it is got such an interesting format because it's about this kid who on his way back from this very momentous, beautiful, super queer summer vacation gets pulled aside by, um, you know, by uh, the TSA and the book, the story is told from inside the interrogation room. And he's like, I le literally the first line, if I remember it correctly, is, let me get one thing straight. I'm not a terrorist, I'm gay. And I'm just like, oh, I'm in. Like, I just, this is, and it's just so beautifully tackles why these two identities rub up against one another, how they relate to one another. Uh, it's just, I just love Arvin. I love his books, but this is like, you know, it's also cool to just see a writer just keep getting better and this book just knocked it out of the park. So very excited for that to come out this year. What's it called again? Can you repeat it? How It All Blew Up by Arvin Amadi. That sounds great. Yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah, I feel like I just got a whole new <laughs> list to make sure that I am checking out. Thank you. It was actually secretly a self-serving question. I was just taking <laughs> notes. <laughs> um, so I would love to hear, um, do you remember the first book that you read that you felt seen in that represented you? Everyone taking a nice long think about that. I thought a lot about this question because I had a really hard time answering it. And I think really for me as a middle-class white bookish kid from a bookish family, I grew up seeing myself in plenty of books, right? I could think of so many characters in books that I read as a child, you know, uh, Meg from A Wrinkle in Time and Emily from Emily of New Moon and Harriet from Harriet the Spy and, you know, so many kids that I, where I felt like I saw myself in these kind of often often maybe shy or nerdy or bookish kind of um, white girls, right? So, um, and I mean, I didn't um, come out as queer till after I graduated high school. I, I don't think I was really thinking about it until I was 18 or 19. So kind of out of, I was gonna say out of YA, obviously I'm like still reading YA. So, but in terms of, in terms of um, looking for books about um, teens. So, yeah, so, so I had a really uh, hard time answering it, but I think for, for that reason that, you know, I generally, in most ways, have been represented. So. 
having said that, when I did come out, um, you know, and I mean, I tr and read everything I could get my hands on that was queer, um, and a lot of it was like, you know, like 1960s lesbian pulp or like The Well of Loneliness and Maurice, all that stuff, which I didn't really relate to at all, but I was just trying to read, you know, anything queer that I could find. So, um, yeah. My answer is no. I, <laughs> I, and I decided to just be okay with that because I feel like sometimes I'm asked this question, I have to like come up with an answer that's like, Animorphs. That was the first time I saw a black character. Period. But you know, Cassie was a girl, and even then, I was constantly struggling with my. I didn't know what trans was yet, but I didn't feel like a girl. So you know, I love Cassie, but I never actually connected with her. So I'm just gonna be okay with the answer that no, I never saw myself as a kid, and I honestly haven't actually seen like a black queer, like trans masculine person in a book that I feel represents me yet either unless someone has a good recommendation right now and you're going to change my life forever. Kyle, I'm looking at you. Right, I'm thinking. <laughs> I'm thinking. You can also let me know afterwards if you come up yeah, with yeah. something. <laughs> like, I know writers, I just don't know, I don't think they have books yet. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we all, I think we all get asked this question a lot, right? Like it's a very yeah. popular question to ask. And my answer for when I was little is always All of a Kind Family by Sydney Taylor, because mm. as far as I can recall, it's the only book that I read about Jews as a child. And these are like Jews in Coney Island in like the 19th century, which is nothing like my life. But I, <laughs> the only book about Jewish kids I could come across. And I was like, fine, this is me. Like I'm cleaning my living room for pennies and I'm like putting a carp in my, I didn't do any of those things. <laughs> like at least they were Jewish. Um, and then around when I figured out that I was a lesbian when I was 18, 17, 18, um, I read Empress of the World by Sarah Ryan. And that was the first like queer girl YA that I read. And it just, it just like burrowed deeply within me. Um, and then as an adult, I'm going to do three, I'm sorry. Um, as an adult, I know that this book has gotten lots of critiques, but Adam by Ariel Schrag took place in Brooklyn in 2006 in like the trans masculine slash dyke scene that I lived in in 2006. And the characters move into an apartment building two doors down from where I lived that summer. Mm. And they literally go to parties that I went to that summer. And I think that I'm actually a walk-on. I think I say something embarrassing about a cat in one scene. Like, I think that's me. Um, <laughs> so there are critiques of that book. And also that book very much represents what that summer looked like in my life. Cause I was just mm. hanging out with those people. Um, I like Casey. I like your answer is no, because mine is only half of me. Um, because there wasn't, there was nothing for a queer Latinx person at all in books that I knew of. Because I think that's also what it comes down to is is access and what books are recommended to you and what books are assigned. It, you know, and I am old enough that going on the internet and finding new books was not a thing when I was in junior high, like and and some of high school, like so it wasn't. It was hard to find books. They existed, I just didn't know what they were. So for me, the first book that got kind of close was The House on Mango Street by Sandra Cisneros because it was the, I got assigned it when I was 14 years old in English. So a freshman year of high school was English class. And it was the first book with like Spanish in it where these kids were dealing with things that me, you know, even though it's Southside Chicago, me in the like suburbs of the desert in California, I was like, this is our struggle. This is what we deal with. These are the things we see all the time. Like, I know these characters, they're people in my neighborhood, but like the book is, it's all straight people. So like, there's like a part of me that can never quite fully connect. Um, so actually the answer I generally give is Ricky Vasquez from My So-Called Life, which is not a book, it's a TV show, but that, from my, that character played by Wilson Cruz changed my life because even though so much of his story still is like very tropey and very much like not the most positive thing in the world um you know I had to deal with being thrown out of my house for being gay I was very very obviously queer you know as Latino I didn't fit in with any of these different communities and getting to see that on a very popular television show that everyone at school watched was a huge deal and I still think about like how brave it was that story to be written and for that actor to portray that character 
Um, and so, yeah, my, my thing doesn't actually come from books. It comes from television. Wendy, it's a hard one. I, I was like, I don't really know. It took me a long time to answer this question. I was thinking maybe, remember when I was like 13, I got my hands on the Tales of the City books by Armistead Maupin. My dad lives in San Francisco and I would go visit him a lot in the summers and he had them because they were originally published in the paper up there. And so like everyone in San Francisco read those books. And so I think I shouldn't have been reading them like in seventh grade, <laughs> but whatever. So yeah, I guess that, I guess that was like the first time it didn't even occur to me that like you would write books about queer people or that would be anything that they would even publish or that that would even be relevant or that was even a thing. So I guess that would be like the first time. Yeah. I, you know, now that you mentioned that, I think about a book that I should not have read, but technically represented me, which was that I was eight years old and I read It by Stephen King, which is a, just a nightmare of a, of a like mistake. Nine. Yes. Yeah. But there is weird gay stuff in it. And I remember like being a kid and being like, oh, this is kind of cool. And then getting older and being like, oh, what is this? There's a whole bunch of them. But like as an eight-year-old, just like, oh, there's just casually gay kids in this book. That's pretty cool. That's awesome. And then I would tell people like how excited I was later. And they're like, you should re go back and reread that book. Because I don't think it's as wonderful as you think it is. And oh. But yeah, like sometimes the things that represented us were actually terrible. Like, I mean, as a kid, you're all allowed to laugh, but me and my brother were super into Speedy Gonzalez. Cause like, what a, it's a nightmare. Like what a terrible thing to feel represented by. But like, we were just like, oh, so as kids, like we actually had very thick accents. And so here was a character with a very thick Mexican accent. So we we're like, oh, we love this character. And then got older and we're like, mm, that was a mistake. <laughs> Yeah, it's something that I always try on my channel very hard to never judge people for what they see themselves in because I think so often our first exposure to that can be something that other people don't uphold as the standard for representation, but it is yeah. that moment. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And Mark, I laughed when you said that though because I'm from LA and Speedy Gonzalez was everywhere. It w Everywhere. Like, it was everywhere. Like the little bumper stickers, like it was like people in Southern California were really obsessed with Speedy Gonzalez, which I get because most of us in Southern California, our heritage is from Central America. And like there was something weirdly prideful about being into it. Like we were kind of like, oh, this is super racist, but you know, it's the only thing we have. So we're just going to take it for ourselves. Like, no. Well, I, I know that we've been, you know, tackling some of the tougher stuff. So I thought maybe we could shift a little bit to uh, some age group stuff again <laughs> because th there was a question I meant to ask earlier and I didn't quite get to it um, which was is there an age group that you find the most difficult to write for or the easiest to write for? Yeah YA for me is um, really difficult and it's like it's a couple of months I've been thinking about like why is that and I think it's, um, it all goes back to, to craft for me personally. I think for whatever reason in YA, I forget, you know, as like writers, we're supposed to talk about like the shard of glass or that kind of like first hurt and that's what creates the character and that's what um, creates their motivations and their story and like the theme and, you know, all of that. For whatever reason with YA, I kind of like skip over whatever it is that hurt them. And middle grade is so much easier for me to immediately know what hurt them. And I think it's because that is also the catalyst because they're so young, they're so much younger. So, you know, in a YA, if Hurricane Child was a YA, um, Caroline's cat, uh, shard of glass or first pain would have been her mother leaving her. But for whatever reason, I think that I wouldn't have figured that out as easily. And it would be like, I would write this entire story and be like, okay, so what's the point of the book? <laughs> Whereas with the middle grade, because she's so much younger, I start with that shard of glass and I start with that hurt. So it's easier for the, um, for the catalyst to become like the thing that hurt them and the thing that kind of like motivates what who their character is. I, I my, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead Ron. Go ahead. Okay, um, uh, I, mine is adult, I can't, everything I write, I just can't, ends up going back to either middle grade or, or young adult. Uh, I have one story idea so far that has survived like 
pre-writing and is still adult, but 99 times out of 100, it ends up as something in, for a younger audience. So between young adult and, and middle grade, you know, I finished my first middle grade manuscript earlier this year. And one of the big differences I found was how much more direct I could be with middle grade, like in terms of craft, where I might want to like sit in an emotion and wander a bit in young adult and really do a lot of like introspective stuff. But what was fun about doing middle grade is like writing these characters and their emotions are just on the surface and that's what they feel. Like there's maybe one extra layer, but it's not like young adult where I can craft these just innately super complex, you know, emotional characters. Not, you know, it's not saying that like 11 and 12 year olds aren't complex, they are. Um, I think especially what changed it was doing school visits to middle grade, to like junior high schools. and talking to 12 and 13 year olds and seeing how they talk. And I'm so glad I did that first before I ever wrote a middle grade because I think it made getting into that mindset a lot easier than like with my first YA, like I didn't start doing school visits until after the book had already been bought. So I'd written this manuscript and edited it without being in that school environment. Um, so yeah, I, f I find that's what's different. I don't know that it's easier. Writing a book is still, it's so hard. Why do we do this? It's so hard. Like, we write so many words. Like, I don't know if it's easier, but I just, I found the, the process just so fascinatingly different. I think I find maybe picture books hardest. Um, I think partly, partly I don't really remember being like four, five, six, seven, eight, years old very well at all um like i remember pretty vividly being you know 12 10 12 15 17 um but uh, but yeah not 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 really sort of five six seven years old and i think because you have so few words like ghost's journey was the first picture book i did and my first attempt at it um, I sent it to a friend who writes picture books to give me some feedback. And she said, you know, well, you need to get rid of like 90% of the words. Because <laughs> I basically, you know, written like, I don't know, maybe an early chapter book or something. And so trying to, to, you know, be that concise and figure out. And I'm not a very visual person either. So what I found with a lot of help from friends was that a lot of the stuff that I had written didn't actually need to be there because it would be shown in the pictures but I'm not really a very visual person. So that piece doesn't come very naturally to me. I mean, I think if you really are visualizing the images as you're writing, that probably helps a lot. But I tend to sort of hear my characters' voices more than I see anything. Um, so that was challenging. And then also just sort of figuring out how to, um, not, not wanting to, um, I, I, okay, now I'm feeling inarticulate, but wanting to be, to be honest about things that are hard and not minimize it, but at the same time, wanting it to be a very gentle book. You know, I was a pretty anxious little kid. I um, I think I was, you know, tended to be quite careful in what I read in some ways. Some of the times I read stuff that was totally inappropriate at the same time because I read what was, ever, was on my parents' bookshelves, but I certainly remember reading lots of things which made me feel very anxious. And so, you know, just sort of conscious of not wanting to, um, write a book that was going to make a kid feel really bad or scared or anxious but at the same time wanting to introduce issues that i think are important for kids to be for everybody to be aware of so just trying to find those sort of lines around how do i how do i introduce difficult topics in a way that's um, gentle um, and that will allow kids to kind of engage on a different level so that one kid can just read it as a story about a cat and not necessarily go much beyond that it's just of course a cat who moves to a new home whereas maybe a reader who's a little older or just picks up on different aspects of the story may have different questions about um you know well why do these people have to, to to leave their home and um you know what you know why might someone become a refugee and uh but but where kids can really choose what level they're going to engage with the book on so so i think i found that most challenging middle grade and ya you've got a lot more words to to play with, you can afford a few more tangents. So, you know, if you've got something in there that didn't absolutely need to be in there, you can probably get away with a little bit of that. But in a picture book, it just felt like there was no room at all for um, for those mistakes. So, yeah, I found that really hard. That's why I found it hard to transition from picture books to middle grade, because picture books, every single word has to make perfect sense. 
and every word has to be related to every single, not it, to every single other word. It's like putting a clock together, I feel like. Whereas with middle grade, every sentence doesn't need to link up to every other sentence. And I try to do that. Like I try to make every snack they eat indicative of something deeper. And I try to make every piece of clothing they wear like deeply representative of themes. And you can't do that in a novel. And that's been really hard for me to let go of. Um, but I think that for me, YA is going to be the hardest once I start chipping away at that again, because I work with young kids. I've worked with two-year-olds through fifth graders every day for eight years. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of adults, and I'm also an adult, so I'm pretty familiar with grown-ups as a community. Um, but I don't work with teenagers, and I don't have a lot of teenagers in my life. And I think that that will make it challenging, just because I can't envision specific people when I'm writing, when I'm writing for that age group in the same way. Wendy, did you want to add anything? I was thinking, I think, I mean, for me, I've only written an adult and young adult, and I've only written one young adult book, public, like as a published book. I've written others that didn't get published, but it, I feel like young adult is harder because I feel such a weight of responsibility, you know, and I really want to like do right by younger readers and at the same time not be too careful with them because I was a teenager and, you know, so I'm just like always torn between that, like wanting to push, you know, I'd, I'd rather like, you know, wanting to push the boundaries in places where that, that will really speak to them, but also wanting to be really careful and care for them in the ways that will be necessary. So I feel like that's a little bit more um, care, I think, emotional care that I put into those stories than I do with adult, where I'm a little bit more, you know, I guess not careless, but just it, I take a little bit less time to think about the reader as I'm drafting. And in young adult, I'm thinking about the reader the whole way through trying to see this from a lot of different lenses, you know, like you said, Kyle, gatekeepers, you know, how will this look to a librarian? How will this look to a parent? How will this look to this type of teenager? What about this? Like, kind of looking at each idea from so many different perspectives as it grows can be, you know, it, it was a bit of a challenge. I would be interested to hear, uh, Casey, I know you've written adult as well as young adult. I wonder if you had that same experience. Um, definitely with adult, I haven't really thought about the gatekeepers in the same way as I do for, for a teen and YA. You're definitely right about that. There's just more of a freedom. Uh, well, to, to wrap us up, I have one more question. So thank you all so much. Um, is there an author that to you has been super influential when it comes to writing queer stories or for writing multiple age groups or anything along those lines? I'll go, if that's okay. Um, I can, I, I think Corey Silverberg has been really influential for me. Corey is the author of What Makes a Baby and Sex is a Funny Word. And Corey's writing style is, it feels effortlessly limitless. Like every single page somehow manages to encompass as broad a range of identities and experiences as possible, while also not feeling while also making it seem incredibly simple. Like in, like in Sex is a Funny Word, there's a bit where it says, um, you know, some, some books call these parts of your body your private parts, but because any part of your body can be private, we call them your middle parts. And just the simple way of saying, because any part of your body can be private. Um, and like the entire book is just full of that kind of very subtle, low key, perfect ways of describing things that like manage to include everyone um, without using a dictionary's worth of words to do it. And that is the that is the kind of like subtlety and brevity that I can only like aspire to. I don't want to mispronounce his name, Benjamin Sinez, Sens. Oh, yeah. In Aristotle? Yeah. Other way around, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm even hesitant to say that because I honestly haven't even read any of his other work, which is a shame. I really should, but Aristotle and Dante okay. is just like the peak. It, I haven't even tried to write a YA novel that even attempts to reach that yet, but that is my goal. <laughs> As my dream is to eventually try to write a book that even like scratches the surface of how gorgeous that novel is. 
Yeah, the, the, you stole one of my two authors because I was going to say, just as, as a queer Latino, like just watching his career has been masterful. It's just a huge, that book is just perfect. It's so, it's so good. Um, I know we're not supposed to touch our face, but I have to. Um, um, <laughs> the other thing I was going to add was Nina LaCour is a huge influence for me. Um, I love watching authors grow. And, and uh, a couple years ago, I read, you know, I do this thing actually, at my, my probably my favorite YA book ever is We Are Okay. I think you want to talk about a word, like a book where, you know, like Kyle, you're sort of talking about how difficult it is to write in this sort of mindset coming from picture books where everything has to be the right word. I feel like We Are Okay is one of those rare books where every word is exactly in the right place. And there is a poeticism to the way Nina LaCour writes. That book is not long. And yet it feels like this huge emotional adventure. It crushes me every time. I love that it's so dark and it goes to such a dark place. And yet I always feel so much joy when I read it. And that's ultimately like, you know, it's just, I don't know that I could ever write a We Are Okay, but I want to write one like that. Like I want to write a book like that, that just crushes you and then just slowly puts you back together. Like that's, that's, that's what I'm, that's what I'm aiming for. So. Mark, we're book twins because I actually was saying, I thought we could only choose one and you chose two. But my second was also We Are Okay. Oh. <laughs> I was like, we can only choose oh, one, good. so I'm going to pick Aristotle. Oh, well, there we go. We chose each other's. It worked out fine. Robin or Wendy, do you have one that you wanted to mention? I couldn't pick one. I, I love both of the books that you've just mentioned. Those are definitely, you know, among my favorites, but um, there's just, there's just way, way, way too many books that are, that have been really important to me. I couldn't, uh, I, I probably couldn't even pick a list of 10 without feeling bad about the ones I wasn't including. Um, but there's, yeah, there's just been so many. Yeah. Well, I'm like the, mystery thriller person, right? So I I was having a really hard time and then I thought, I'll just pick one that I just read that made me think I wanna be like you when I grow up, as always, like every time I read her books. But um, there's an adult crime fiction author named Jennifer Hillier, well known. And she has a new book out called Little Secrets where it's just, the way she writes tension and the way she just like goes all in on these characters and these, like the premises that she comes up with, I just, yeah, she's one where I, you know, she, it's very dark. She writes very dark crime fiction, but when she, when I read it, I'm just like, okay, maybe one day when I grow up, I can write like you, you know, that feeling when you read a book. Hi again, Rachel. Hi, she's back with glasses. Um, so can we just go down the line and just reiterate um, who you are, um, what I don't know what you want to say, what, whatever book you want people to be paying attention to most, whether it's something that you want them to pre-order or your most recent release, um, where people can find you on social media or the internet in general, if you want to do your website. Um, and CC, just go last and reiterate your channel and stuff like that. Cool. Are we doing alphabetical here? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Let's go. Right. Oh, okay. Sorry. Rachel, actually, can I ask you a quick question? Do you know when the, um, when is this going to go up? They've been taking me about a week to edit and post. So it okay. should be from next week. Um, I will email you all when it's up. Because that affects when I say if Felix Ever After is out yet or not, because it's out next Tuesday. <laughs> so <laughs> I guess I'll just keep saying May 5th. Um, okay. So I'll start. So I'm Case and Calendar. My most recent book is Felix Ever After, out on the 5th of May. Um, I can be found on Twitter and Instagram. Both of them are case and calendar, but Instagram has a period in the middle. Um, my name is Wendy Hurd, and my next book up is called She's Too Pretty to Burn, which is my young adult uh, thriller debut, and that's out next March. And you can find me on all the socials uh, at Wendy D. Heard, like Wendy Diaz and David Heard. I'm Kyle. Um, my next book out is Too Bright to See. It comes out from Dial Books next year at some point. I don't know when. Um, you can find me at kylelukoff.com. And on Twitter, I think if you just type my name and you'll find me, but my Twitter handle is shekels underscore library. 
Uh, my name is Mark Oshiro. Um, I have an upcoming YA fantasy out on September 15th, 2020 called Each of Us a Desert. You can find me at markoshiro.com. Uh, and then on the Twitter and the Instagram, I am Mark Does Stuff. And I'm Robin Stevenson. I'm on uh, Twitter at uh, Robin underscore Stevenson. Um, and my website's just robinstevenson.com. And my newest release is this one here, Pride, the Celebration and the Struggle. Um, and I have a picture book and middle grade book coming out next year. Oh, and my YA novel, this one, which has now been moved to May 2021. I am CC Ewing from the BookTube channel, Problems of a Book Nerd. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at CC Ewing underscore. Um, and you can go follow my channel at Problems of a Book Nerd. Hey y'all, thanks so much for tuning into this panel. If you're looking for more panels like it, make sure you check out the All By My Shelf playlist on our YouTube page. It'll tell you all of the different panels that you're able to watch. 